from the trade hub of the ancient Silk Road to the popular travel destination with the beautiful scenery and profound cultural heritage, Xinjiang has always been the mysterious land in our mind. Unfortunately, terrorism and religious extremism had cast a long shadow over the region. During the International Seminar on Counterterrorism, Deradicalization and Human Rights Protection, I was given the opportunity to exchange views with experts on counterterrorism and human rights from all over the world and visit various parts of Xinjiang to see for myself the results in the fight against terrorism and extremism and the development of human rights protection in the region. Seeing is believing. I was greatly impressed by the warm classroom environment and active participation of the students at Kashgar Vocational Skills Education and Training Center. These young people, who once went astray, told me that by learning Mandarin, vocational skills and basic legal knowledge, they are full of hope for the future and wish to create wealth with their own hands to provide a better life for their families. Now please join me for a series of interviews with experts and scholars where we have more in-depth discussion on the long-standing issue of countering terrorism and extremism, as well as China's development path and its role in global governance. Today we are happy to be joined here by Professor Matteo Bresson, International Relations and Strategic Studies from Lumsa University, Italy. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. Thanks. Based on your research and limited experiences here in Xinjiang, what do you think of uh, the urgency of fighting radicalization and uh, extremism, so to speak, uh, that has caused a lot of instability in Xinjiang, which is also called New Frontier in China. I think that Xinjiang is a very important region for in China, and uh, the stability of uh, Xinjiang is uh, one of the main goals of Xi Jinping policy, and also an important goal for the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, just to, to be very frankly, it's clear that the stability of Xinjiang is uh, very important to development of the region and to have the possibility to, to um, develop the Xinjiang as an important hub for the Belt and Road Initiative. So without stability in this region, it's impossible to improve the Belt and Road Initiative or China could have some problems. For example, the terrorism and radicalization is a common threat in the world, but in particular in this region, uh, we know that and that we have the opportunity in these days to, to visit the museum and we see a lot of uh, records of terrorist attack in, in Xinjiang. Uh, in, uh, in our country, in Italy, also in many European countries, uh, we, we don't have a clear vision of the terrorist threat that uh, China uh, had in the past in this country. So I learned about the, the chronological history of terrorism here, and uh, I have the opportunity to understand how the uh, political and social approach made by Chinese gov government here is important to prevent the, the radicalization. There are millions and millions of Muslims around the world, and therefore it is very important that we have to be very careful about the differences between radicalized religious beliefs uh, and a majority of the Islamic believers. Uh, therefore, uh, and the understatement is that a majority of the Muslims uh, could easily get integrated with the rest of the world. However, we do have uh, organizations such as ISIL whose rise in the Middle East uh, caused strong repercussions uh, uh, and instability in that region. And perhaps uh, the spillovers could also be felt in other uh, cases of uh, violent attacks. So what do you think of say, the differences that we should be uh, able to tell? I believe that uh, radicalization is uh, as a problem not connected with Islam. We, when we talk about terrorism and extremism, sometimes we associate it uh, to the Islam, but that is not correct. We have to talk ab about a small minority of Muslim involved in terrorism and in radicalization. And that is sometimes in some European country and maybe in some electoral campaign, uh, this, this issue has been used to political consensus. And that is very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, what happened with the Islamic State 
in Syria and Iraq. We know that uh, Islamic State in Syria and Iraq was the continuous of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, born in 2003, after the American uh, invasion of Iraq. Uh, how these uh, groups, these very particular groups, uh, became a, 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 a parastate in the Middle East? Because we have to consider that, uh, as you know, we don't have an international definition of terrorism. And the Islamic State was not terrorism, was many things, was criminal, criminal activity. Of course, it was terrorism, but it was an idea of new state for Muslim. But th that kind of message wasn't real. It was a message of violence and that inspired a lot of extremists in the region. But uh, the beginning of the crisis uh, must be uh, see in the Syrian crisis and Iraq crisis. When you have uh, a failed state like Iraq, like Syria, where you have the, uh, the fall of institution, you have uh, a, competi a competition between uh, tribes, confessionalism, you don't have a central authority. And so, if you don't have a central authority, you have a lot of militia, a lot of groups, a lot of extremism. They would like to create a new order in that area. Islamic State uh, rise between the Syrian crisis that was at the beginning an internal, an internal crisis between Syrian opposition and President Bashar al-Assad and then Syrian crisis became uh, a global war uh, supported by regional powers. We call it a proxy war perhaps proxy between war. major powers. Of course. Um, since 1990, China suffered a number of uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, so many innocent people have been left dead. And they were killed brutally. Therefore, how to uh, eliminate the root causes and negative uh, and the hotbed for the rise of extremism has been prioritized on the agenda of not only the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region but the central authorities. Therefore, the integration of a majority of the Muslims into the job market uh, uh, with China's opening up 70 years after we founded the PRC. Now, what do you think of, say, for example, the release of a white paper um, one month ago by the State Council of the Chinese government to, to establish a school for vocational education and training so that the, the, the ordinary young Vegas could have the basic labor skills, uh, they could easily find a job and they could uh, brush aside uh, the dangers of uh, religious extremism? I think that the vocational center, edu vocational educational center, it's a, a, a very interesting approach to prevent uh, the radicalization. Because I think that this kind of training at school, uh, I, I, visit, I visited the, uh, the, the, the center in Kashgar, and uh, I believe that if you are able to counter the reason, the social, educational problem of young people, you can prevent. For example, many of the guys that were in, in Kashgar explain us that start to believe to radical uh, Islam or uh, some, vision, some violent vision of the world. Or, or many of them were there for uh, previous criminal activity. You cannot, in my opinion, put these young guys in jail and don't give them an opportunity to be reintroduced in the world of job, to, to give them an opportunity to learn, to, 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 to find uh, their personal skill and their opportunity to, to be reintegrated in the society. For my experience, this is a, a particular approach. And to be honest, the, the global uh, jihad that we face since 2014 pose many challenges, not only, of course, for China, because now we are, we are, we are analyzing the Chinese example, but for the global community. China tried to find uh, um, uh, an issue, uh, a new tool to, to face this kind of challenges. Uh, to be honest, it's difficult to see a common strategy, for example, in Europe, where we had a lot of problems with people who radicalized, or many peoples that uh, 6,000 approximately that have been, um, that ha have gone 
to Syria and Iraq. So the Chinese solution, the, the Chinese approach to these challenges is very interesting and it, it should be analyzed much better also in the Western uh, Institute and Western University. Exactly. That's why uh, you are put on the show to explain the Italian perspective uh, on the impact of China's uh, approach in handling extremism and uh, terrorism. Um, you were here to attend an international seminar on human rights and how to de-radicalize uh, extremism. You also visited an exhibition showcasing atrocities of extremism and terrorism since the early 1990s. You visited a local religious school and also went to Kashgat to take a look at uh, you know, the vocational uh, school helping young Uyghurs uh, you know, improve their command of uh, Mandarin and basic labor skills. Now, looking back, do you think, uh, uh, despite all the controversies that fled up as a result of the uh, vocational education, China does have its own reason to go ahead no matter what, and uh, we should uh, set an example for the rest of the world which uh, may somehow fall fallen victim to religious extremism. Look, we need to have a soft approach and uh, hard approach and this is the Chinese way and we should not um, you know a blink in the standoff in all the debates we just go ahead we should learn uh, from uh, uh, whoever uh, that went through experiences of terrorism and the, 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 the bitter memories of the terrorism we should stand together and stand up to the challenge of a common threat of course that, that we are talking about a common threat for all countries in the world you have to remind that uh, in 2015, people who joined Islamic State came from 100 countries. So, the China uh, approach to these challenges should be analyzed as a, a preventive approach to the, 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 radical, the radicalization process. We, uh, I think that uh, uh, the idea is to develop this area to give opportunity to the young people or poor people to find a way for their job, for their life, uh, and help them. Uh, many of uh, people in Europe, for example, became for poor situation, social problems, uh, economical problems. So if, you don't are ab if, you, if we are not able to uh, manage with these challenges, we will have a lot of people in Europe, uh, I want to remember you, we had 6,000 6, of foreign fighters that started from European town like Paris, like Brussels and joined the Islamic State. So for many years uh, we forgot to help these people. We forgot to deal with social problems, economical problems, job opportunities. And so I think that uh, this social approach is very interesting and I want to uh, give you an example. I have been, uh, for example, in Kosovo. Many of Kosovo. Kosovo. Many of young people there uh, uh, did their work and, uh, and lived in very, very bad condition. You mean they were left jobless, yes. and marginalized in the society. Marginalized in the society. Most of them decide to join radicalism Islam, and uh, many of them, uh, approximately 400, decide to go on to Syria and Iraq. But the beginning was a, a social problem and then became a religious or extremist problem for their life. With regard to governance, how could you help refugees who found their way to continental Europe uh, earn their own living? And in doing that, uh, how could you somehow uh, single out the dangerous extremists and help a vast majority of the refugees get integrated easily uh, with the mainstream society? Uh, we have to be very honest and speak very frankly. A refugee crisis in Europe uh, has the uh, most important topics for the next uh, European Commission because uh, we know how many political problems we had in the last few years uh, regarding this issue. If you look at uh, most of the political agenda, and also in Italy, we have been focused on the immigration crisis. And sometimes, sometimes, but not always, you have a connection between 
migration crisis and terrorism and criminal activity. Thank you for being with us in the first part of the program. Stay with us, we'll be right back. We saw hundreds of terrorist attacks and the rise of extremism. Americans and other Western powers tried to monopolize concepts of human rights. How do you see a double standard, for example, on de radicalization? It is uh, not only double standard, it is uh, almost uh, stupid to criticize Chinese for disrespect of human rights. Dr. Prajak Markovic, Vice President of the Socialist Party of Serbia. Since 1990, we saw hundreds of terrorist attacks and the rise of extremism in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Despite all the kind and benevolent policy moves by the Han Chinese to rebuild people's hopes and expectations for a better life, some of the extremists uh, dislike what we have done and they arouse so much hate and so many innocent Chinese have been killed here. I'd like to know your thoughts after a few days of uh, visits uh, right here to attend uh, a seminar on human rights and de-radicalization. Americans and other Western powers tried to monopolize concept of human rights. They said that there is only one kind of human rights and we in Washington, D.C., in Pennsylvania Avenue, we decide what is human rights. So we can put people in cage they put children in cages on Mexican border, but we are going to tell you Chinese what to do because we are, we, we are only who know what are human rights. On the other hand, human rights is a complex concept and it seems that there is some kind of human rights idea in Confucian theory. So in Confucian thought, many scholars have found uh, some kind of human rights. So there is not only one kind of human rights. There are more kinds of human rights. Universality as opposed to diversity and plurality. Yeah, universality. Our examination of, uh, of course. Uh, values. Now, uh, it seems uh, those uh, suicide bombers in Israel who killed innocent Israelis uh, might be viewed by Western media as uh, terrorists. But those who did carry out the same suicide bombing in Xinjiang would be called freedom of fighters. Yeah, it is double standards applied in Chechenia, applied here, applied in my country. We had a, a, a part of my country, Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo, yes. Yes, settled by Albania. You have lost the Kosovo. Yeah. Now, since the 1970s and the 80s, uh, especially with the end of the Cold War, the rise of extremism and the terrorism captured the media attention the world over. Now, human rights have been seriously abused. In most cases, how do you see a double standard, for example, on de-radicalization, on using extremism as a leverage to sabotage other countries? How can that undermine the global campaign in ensuring peace and stability? America uh, set to fire three, three or four countries for, for this uh, terror, terror, for September 11. Uh, America destroyed Libya, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. China didn't destroy other countries. China is building. China is educating. It is a great difference. So America respo American response to terror is uh, uh, scor uh, scorch the other countries, uh, m make the ruins of other countries. China's answer is quite opposite. Build society, build harmony educates young people. So uh, it is uh, not only double standard, it is uh, almost uh, stupid to criticize Chinese for disrespect of human rights because uh, if we compare uh, policy, we see that uh, uh, China actually uh, improves the lives 
instead of r ruining them, like America. Yeah, poverty elevation, for example, yes. is uh, yes. one case in point that showcases the success of China's economic development, namely to live and let live uh, in an inclusive society. But still, many things we have done have caused uh, controversies in the West. Um, let's uh, go back to the issue of uh, wars Americans launched uh, that have destroyed some of the countries you mentioned. The United States is so proud of exporting values and democracy, like in the color revolution, like in the Arab revolution. But what has caught them unprepared is the exit strategy and the military drawdown. For example, the current negotiations with the Taliban uh, proves very difficult. Um, what do you think of uh, the construction or reconstruction of uh, soft power uh, and political institutions in war torn countries like uh, Afghanistan and Iraq? The Americans say, yes, we have destroyed the old regime, but we try to introduce a new one by building up expectations for great values. This is something they are so proud of. It is like fish soup. It is easy to make uh, fish soup from fish, but it is very difficult to make uh, fish from the fish soup. So uh, Americans make, made a fish soup from these countries, but they are not able to reconstruct them. On the other hand, people's Republic... You know, back in 1984, when Ronald Reagan went to Shanghai to deliver a speech at the Fudan University, at the very beginning of his speech, he said, let me cite one Chinese uh, proverb. Um, running a big country is like cooking a small fish. So <laughs> y your uh, comments on fish uh, immediately brought me back to memories on Regan's speech in Fudan. Then what do you think of the implications of a running a big country like a cooking a small fish? <laughs> in Chinese. <laughs> well, uh, we have a, 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 a man who, who on the top of America is a man who is uh, uh, outdated. Donald Trump is building wall. Chinese are building bridges, highways, uh, uh, railways. So uh, paradoxically, soft power now is on the Chinese side because where America destroys, Chinese are constructing. So everywhere, from here to the end of Silk Road in, a, in a Piray by Athens, a people are admired by Chinese and by their capability to remove mountains, to put the walls closer. I would like to, to show you this book. It is American historian Peter Frankopan. It is a Silk Road book. Uh, this part of the world, Xinjiang, was the center of the world for thousands of years because this part connected east and west. East and west were connected via this Silk Road, via Xinjiang and other parts of the Central Asia. Thank you so much. I do appreciate uh, your very interesting and deep analysis about politics uh, and history. Please allow me, uh, to my friends, I uh, congratulate birthday much before, so uh, please allow me to uh, wish uh, happy birthday to People's Republic. Chu Chongguo, Ji Shi Sui, Shen Zhi Kuai. Chu Chongguo, Ji Shi Sui, Shen Zhi Kuai. Happy birthday to the 70 year old People's Republic of China. Thank you so much. That's my presentation. Yes, yes.